And uh, thank you for all being here this evening. I'm Dr. Shelley Lenz, the candidate for governor of North Dakota. I use the pronouns she, her. Tonight's listening session about LGBTQ plus issues is part of my campaign's virtual listening, listening session series that I'm hosting to help all North Dakotans have a voice when it comes to our state government and the issues facing our communities and us. I'm going to start with a few remarks and thoughts, and then I'll share a few considerations for the evening. And then we will call on speakers who have signed up to speak in advance. We will also have time to open the floor for a wider discussion. Just as a note, we are recording this evening's discussion and streaming it on our Facebook page. Part of the reason I decided to run for governor is because I feel our current governor does not represent us or even seem to listen to us, the voices of all North Dakotans. We all lead interesting and complex lives, and there's no one size fits all solution to the issues facing the state. All of us on this call come from very different walks of life, and we need to learn to work together and support each other collaboratively. As many of us on this call are aware, unfortunately, the North Dakota Republican Party recently was in the news for a homophobic and harmful platform on the issues of LGBT. BTQ plus rights. And like many of you, I was shocked. I live in a very conservative part of the state, many of whom likely vote Republican. And frankly, I have not experienced this level of ugliness in Western North Dakota as shown on the Republican platform in my community, even though we have prominent LGBTQ persons who are professionals, elected officials, teachers, students, and I'm hurt that a North Dakota political party would be so ugly to a significant part of our population. I am also afraid that perhaps I've been blind to the LGBTQ lived experience in North Dakota. And again, because I didn't think this was so ugly here in this very conservative part of the state. So we hear with our prominent LGBTQ persons that I know of, we're just simply living here, like all North Dakotans, living, loving in a place we've cho chosen to call home. So the recent official North Dakota Republican Party's homophobic and hurtful platform that emerged gave me pause that perhaps I need to listen to your experience about the LGBTQ experience in North Dakota. I believe all humans shall and will have equal rights under the law, and we need to continue to advocate, fight, and protect those rights. We have to do better, and our leaders must demand better. I want to reaffirm my commitment to providing a safe space for our LGBTQ plus neighbors to share their thoughts this evening. And I would like to invite everyone to introduce yourself in the chat with your pronouns as well. Please be sure to be respectful of the personal stories being shared and join me in learning how we can better support one another. A few kind of housekeeping notes for tonight's session. If you signed up ahead of time to speak, we will work through our speakers list and I will call you by name and share your remarks. If you have further input, please share it with me via email at listeningtour at lensvigfornd.com and we'll post that in the chat. And that will be, um, we'll send a follow-up email with this information. This listening session is being recorded and streamed on Facebook, like I said. Please use the chat box on Zoom to share your name, where you're from, and feel free to post questions or comments in there. We will do our best to respond to the comments and questions that come up, and also some of the ones on Facebook. We will also take speakers after the speaking list is complete, and you can indicate that you'd like to speak in the chat or raise your hand, uh, which you can find under the participants label. Please use this session to be open-minded and respectful of all participants. We will aim to wrap up in about an hour. And again, please send any feedback to the listening tour at lensvigfornd.com if you are able to share live tonight or you feel uh, like you want a quieter place to talk. With, with that, I would like to begin with our first speaker, speaker Tyler Alvin. Hey, everybody. Uh, first off, I want to thank Dr. Shelley, 
uh, Ben and Melissa for uh, organizing, organizing this listening session. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Tyler Hogan. I am the Party Affairs Director for the North Dakota Democratic NPL and a proud member of the LGBTQIA community. We have made many strides in recent years as a nation in the fight for rights and acceptance for LGBTQ plus individuals. However, there is still so much to be done, uh, particularly here at home in North Dakota. And there are two things in particular that I would like to briefly highlight this evening. The primary task that I believe we all need to work on, not just in general, but also within the LGBTQ community is lifting up uh, transgender individual, individuals, uh, particularly trans women of color. Our transgender community, both binary and non-binary, are very often marginalized, left behind, and forgotten, even as we forge legislative and legal victories in the battle for equality. Transgender persons are at the highest risk for being victims of discrimination, sexual assault, acts of violence, and suicide. An LGBTQ protection bill in our state, Senate Bill 2303, which included among other things, employment and housing protections uh, on the basis of gender identity, failed in the legislature last year. That was the fifth time in 10 years that an anti-discrimination bill uh, was shut down by the legislature. Before that, another anti-discrimination bill was introduced in the House by Representative Mary Johnson, a Republican legislator in Fargo. But that bill did not include gender identity in the definition of sexual orientation. Both the ACLU and the North Dakota Human Rights Council uh, opposed this effort, and rightfully so, because there can never be true equality without full gender identity protections. The other issue that I, I want to bring to the forefront uh, as we discuss LGBTQ plus uh, rights is the issue of our LGBTQ plus youth, in particular, the issue of youth homelessness uh, in our community. While, the, while LGBTQ individuals make up between four and 7% of the general population, between nine and 40% of homeless youth in America identify as LGBTQ. North Dakota ranks among the worst in regards to policies addressing youth homelessness in general and in regards to addressing LGBTQ youth homelessness specifically, the policies are pretty much non-existent. We need to highlight the disproportionate risk the youth in our community face in regards to homelessness, sexual exploitation or survival sex, incarceration, major depression, anxiety, and suicide, as well as the fact that while not any one program or person can solve the entire problem as a whole, we unfortunately cannot legislate love or acceptance. There are many things that we can advocate to pull our most vulnerable uh, from the brink. In both instances, those of us with a platform with which to speak should be addressing these issues, advocating programmatic solutions and community services, and just as importantly, letting people know that they are loved, they are accepted and valued, and, and that we will pledge to fight for them every day. Um, and with that, I, I want to thank again, uh, Dr. Shelley, um, Ben and Melissa for allowing me and the other speakers to join in uh, on this platform. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tyler. And uh, thank you for walking us through some of that history. I shamefully was not aware how bad it was. So thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Cody Severson.
Yes. We can hear you now. Cool. cool. Okay. Um, I don't even know how to like <laughs> just say anything. And uh, Tyler, thank you so much for actually going through the history and going through that. Um, so I'm in Fargo. I, the only my only two really two cents that I want to add on there is um. So North Dakota doesn't have statistics for LGBTQ plus individuals in general. Um, one of the things that my organization is kind of trying to work on is increasing um, resources for individuals, for LGBTQ plus individuals um, facing suicidality. And facing, as it currently sorry, stands- Facing what, Cody? Uh, so suicidality. Oh, okay. Um, so okay. individuals sorry. with mental health issues um, who are, um, and who complete suicide, really and complete suicide. Um, North Dakota doesn't um, ask after like a death certificate is signed about a person's identi identity in any sort. And so we have no way of knowing um, how many LGBTQ plus individuals complete suicide or um, face mental health issues in that, in that way. So um, that's, I think, one thing to highlight about like just our um, our governmental system in that capacity. Um, but otherwise, I, I just echo Tyler's um, words in the fact that um, over the past 10 years, we we have been fighting for um, anti-discrimination legislation and it's been knocked, it's been defeated every single year. And usually um, usually the, the verbiage that we get back is that business owners uh, will not have a reason to fire their um, employees based on how they're clients are reacting to other individuals working for them. Um, so, which is asinine, but um, the, those are my two cents. I'll yield to whoever else now. Okay, thank you for that, Cody. I appreciate that. Um, so our, some of our speakers are still about to come on uh, in just a bit. So while we're waiting for them, uh, they might be having a little bit of technical issues right now, but uh, I would like to ask if anybody wishes to share any comments. Otherwise, I'll open the discussion with one of our questions that have been sent to us. If you have, if you'd like to share a comment right now, even though you're not a listed speaker, you can just raise your hand or raise your hand like this. <laughs> okay, I have. Um, well, there's one question waiting that was sent to me. So I do have a question. So out here in the West, we have very small towns and um, it, it's probably harder to connect with, with fellow uh, LGBTQ plus people that are going through the same thing. They're not sure, you know, they're, you know, they're confused and they don't know where to go. And it might be a little different than the urban side. I'm not sure. But what kind of, let's, whoever might be listening right now on Facebook, um, and I guarantee you there are, because th there is a, a strangeness. So, or a, a, an inhibition to, to speak out in a small population. Where can they go in North Dakota to really find somebody? And I'm going to ask this of Tyler and Cody and, and maybe people that are, have had to, that similar path, especially if you lived in North Dakota, where did you go to be able to kind of work through some of these things? I know Cody, you said you have your, your um, foundation and everything. So where would they go? They can anonymously reach out to you somewhere. So, in just my two cents, truth be told, unless you're living in like a larger city, there is nowhere to go. You can um, say that again, Cody, what? Um, unless you're living in a city like Fargo or Grand Forks or Bismarck Mandan, like there is nowhere to go right now. Okay, in, so it's the same in, in the Dakota. cities as it is in the small towns here in North Dakota, would that be yeah. right? That's your experience? That's my perspective, yeah. Okay. I mean, I grew up in Grafton, um, a town of 5,000, and um, I didn't know anything about um, gay people until I moved to Fargo. Okay. Um, I'm not even, I'm not even, but yeah, I didn't know anybody else who was gay or identified in any part of the spectrum, but um, that's my perspective that there's really, like, we don't have resources outside of the bigger areas. That's, that's absolutely correct, and 
and, and on that note, that's why it's so important not only uh, for uh, individuals uh, who have a platform to speak, uh, to speak out on these issues and, and let those uh, individuals know, particularly in uh, rural communities, um, that someone is, is fighting for them or that there mm -hmm. are members of the community yeah. who are serving in public office uh, someone that, you know, they, they can look to. Uh, but also, there are great uh, resources on the, on the national level, uh, two that come to mind, uh, True Colors United and uh, the Trevor Project. Um, and then there are also advocacy groups, of course, like the, the Human Rights Campaign um, that, that do phenomenal work. Um, but part of that is just educating and getting that information out there because uh, many individuals, particularly youth, uh, they, they don't know where to go. And right. the resources aren't here, but uh, letting them know that there are outlets uh, in a community uh, that, that has their back uh, is, is integral, uh, is especially um, especially in our rural communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, it looks like one of our speakers was able to arrive. So I will, um, I'll get back to that question if somebody else has some answers or you can put it in the chat or you can also email it to us and we will email that to everybody that's, that's watching and we'll put it in the comments as well. Um, so, uh, so Kyle Thorson, are you on here? Where are you? Oh, there you are. Hello. You're right there. Okay, Kyle, thanks for get, jumping on with us. Um, Tyler and Cody just spoke, and um, welcome. And uh, share, share, share us with us what you know. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy to do so. So I see a few familiar faces on here, which is great. It's good to see everybody as, uh, else that I haven't met before as well. I'm, I'm Kyle and I live up here in Grand Forks, North Dakota. I am running for the Senate this year in District 18 as an openly LGBT person here in the state. Um, what's kind of fun is if I do get elected, I guess that'll be the first openly out um, gay person in the Senate joining Joss Boucher in the House, which is kind of fun. That's a little historic. So it's um, always an adventure, right? So I've worked in North Dakota, um, at the university, when I was a graduate student, I worked on um, a grad program there that was LGBT focused and helping to build some community efforts. I've helped sponsor and run Pride here in Grand Forks for the last five years, and my little heart's broken because this year is um, not happening or happening in a very small way, I guess, compared to previous years, but we will survive, I suppose, and find a way to, <laughs> to get together. Um, and really, you know, had some good opportunities with city council here in Grand Forks. Um, several years ago, we were able to pass um, some policies to offer protection for housing and employment with city city workers um, and housing kind of citywide, which was really awesome in Grand Forks. So just had a good number of opportunities to work with people in that community. And it's, you know, North Dakota, I'm sure many of you know, is uh, it's a hard state to be in. I think it's always um, a challenge to live in a place that's super conservative and feels like you don't have easy ways to access people or get connected. But I also find that means that the community, when you do connect and do find people, becomes really tight and really close. And yes. I've been yeah. grateful for the those people around me. And certainly with the party too, um, nearly everybody I've met has been very supportive. So anyway, that's a little about myself and what I worked on, but. Um, Hopefully that's useful to you. I'm happy to answer questions or talk about whatever you want. All right. Thank you for that, Kyle. And thank you for running. And everybody, vote for Kyle. Uh, he'll be out and about. He's been working hard on his campaign, running a great campaign. Yeah, I think you're coming here this Saturday, right, Shelly? I am. Have some in fun. the flesh. Masked, but in the flesh. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited to, uh, we're going to do some uh, pounding the pavement together. And so, um, you know, also reach out to us and, and we'll, we'll meet, meet for coffee or something. Okay, um, so I am gonna go back to a question that um, 
there's a question from the audience for anybody here. So what specific actions can everyone watching take to help make those measurable improvements for LGBTQ people? What can we do? Like, I mean, one, be more aware. So thank you for your educating us a little bit. But what would you like us to, I, I, I feel that we're, we could be very, very supportive if we knew what to do. <laughs> I, I, I will, I, I guess I will speak up first. Um, I, I think that uh, one important facet is just, ad, is to start with advocating uh, policy, coming up with uh, programmatic solutions uh, for example, uh, in fewer than 20 years ago, the majority of people in this uh, country uh, did not support uh, gay marriage. As more individuals were empowered to come out, uh, as legal battles were forged, uh, and as we um, received vocal support from national leaders uh, and prominent uh, politicians, uh, we, we were able to really make those strides, uh, which culminated in um, a, a string of legal decisions that have, have been beneficial uh, and, and historic uh, and very consequential for our community. So the first thing is um, making sure that uh, we have cohesive plans that address uh, LGBTQ concerns, um, and that we also, much like with this uh, listening session, that we also bring in LGBTQ voices uh, to help not only mold that policy, but uh, but to be able to promote it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that, Tyler. I. How about James? Can James Ch James Falcon chime in on that? Are you here, James? There you are. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you re repeat? Yeah, so what, you know, one, what, you know, a lot of us are becoming more aware of um, kind of your experience, but, and we're obviously, so a lot of us are actually supportive, uh, but what specific actions can everyone watching take to help make measurable improvements for LGBTQ people, plus people? Uh, I would say that uh, definitely working with, not, work, not so much working, but if, say like if you're an ally or even, I mean, you could still be in the community to support uh, LGBTQ uh, to into spirit youth. Um, last week, um, you, many may have heard, and I know Alex was there, uh, up in Belcourt, uh, the Turtle Mountain Tribal Council recently, pa they passed um, legislation for the tribal code to redefine marriage as, instead of between man and woman, it's with spouse and spouse. Um, and we were up there helping. And there were speakers there and, you know, so, and people that I spoke to, uh, you know, they say they, as a youth, you know, wish that they that they had support then, um, and even some now. So I would say definitely, you know, if you know of an, uh, you know youth, um, you know, especially if they live in a household which may not necessarily be supportive. I guess you know, making sure that you are there as a you know as a mentor of sorts to help to help with the youth to help. I guess guide not so much guide but to help. Be there as as they make their way through through life. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Okay, thank you for that. And as, with, with focusing on the youth, and I'll think, and I just remember this one teenager back about ten years ago that was living in Kildare that eventually came to me, and it was probably because I was, you know, a veterinarian, and you know, there's just a certain. Anyway, he eventually came and just said something to me, but he was a little more bold. 
uh, and he had a comfortable relationship with me before then. Are there like hints that you can do to open the door for some of those shyer youth that you think might need someone to talk to? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, are, do they make little, I mean, how did you make little hints to somebody to see if it was safe to talk to? That, so I'll be a little more aware. Okay, I, I know that, well, for, you know, Magic City Equality, we've done um, in the past kind of youth meetings, you know, for youth that are either, you know, maybe questioning or curious or even, or they may be out totally. So they would come to these meetings and it'd be kind of like a little social networking. So that would be kind of the way that we did here. Okay. Um, so instead of reaching, instead of, you know, going out and you know or asking they would come to us in a way but I guess nowadays I would say for the most part you and I've noticed this I guess as I got older that I guess youth are more out okay for the most part I know they're you know I'm not gonna say all youth but I, I would say some well that's uh, an improvement yes yeah I mean things have from have improved definitely and I kind of wish it was like that when I was younger, but yeah. Um, yeah. Well, there, it's like that now because what you guys are doing, right? right? <laughs> but I guess, you know, if you are, you know, a teacher or a business, some, something like that, where I guess you have an office, you know, if you put, you know, I, I know they have like ally stickers that oh. you can get or make, you know, something with like a rainbow or, you know, even, you know, oh. Okay. Like posters or anything like that, you know, that says, you know, this is a safe place, uh, you know, for the LGBTQ community. I guess that could be kind of an easy. I, to, yeah, that seems so that, obvious. You know, that's standing on the roof, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. That seems so obvious. And I feel like a ding dong for um, <sighs> not just putting that on my office door or something like that, you know, or, you know, but, something. Yeah, I mean, stuff. that would be an excellent way to. No, that might be something a business could do is just put a little rainbow somewhere just says hey you know mm -hmm. okay i i really like that that's like a very practical simple subtle not in your face but everybody would know it if they're looking right ah i love that okay sorry that i i just feel like that seems so simple and i can't believe that i, I just <laughs> um okay so um does anybody have any thoughts on that that likes to speak Oh, Clara. Clara has her hand raised. Clara Darby? Derby? Yeah, just some things off the top of my head of just things that um, people can do as allies to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, really easy things, normalizing, introducing yourselves with your pronouns, normalizing, asking people for their pronouns. I see Pretty much everyone either in their introduction or in their little name thing has their pronouns. I realize that I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> in, the, in my introduction, I um, give my pronouns. And also obviously making an effort to learn and use people's correct pronouns. Um, I think as allies, one of the most important things that we can do in our day to day, um, especially when it's not an event or something, like it's easy to show up to Right in the park or go to marches and that kind of stuff. But in the day-to-day, -day, especially when um, there might not be people of the group that you're trying to be an ally to or present is continuously standing up for them, not tolerating homophobic jokes or disparaging language or any of that kind of thing in your peers. I know people in the Midwest are not confrontational, but it is really important to, like, the, Changing hearts, if we can change hearts and minds, but we can set the precedent for what is acceptable in the public sphere. And you don't know, like you don't know where someone might be closeted or their kid might be out and you don't know that. And so that is another way to kind of signal across the board that you, not only are you a safe space, but you will fight for the people that you are standing by. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's important to, you know, stand up even when they, the person there isn't there and they're standing up for them. So not tolerating that. So I like that. Uh, thank you, Clara. Um, Cody, do you have anything to add to that? Um, 
Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Um, I think Claire did a really great job of describing why it's important to um, have pronouns as well. And um, just a, kind of as a fun side note, if like individuals who aren't sure about like their gender identity or like where they put themselves on the spectrum, whether it's non-binary or um, agender or anything like that, when they hear other people describing the pronouns to them, it helps them to kind of um, acknowledge that the environment is friendly and that um, there's more um, there's more possibilities out there, which is really a uh, fun affirming, affirming environment. Um, and I also want to echo what James said about um, having just affirming um, items within your office space or within like just your personal space, because a lot of times when a, a queer person comes into a, a space, the only way that we know that it is affirming is if we see um, a rainbow or a, um, like a poster from the Trevor Project or um, just any other organization that we know is friendly to us. Um, when that's up in the space, it's a lot more helpful to know that we're going to be respected and this person knows a little bit about who we are and we don't have to explain everything. Um, it's, it's really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I just, that is so simple, kind, hospitable thing to do that I, I've been in business for 20 years <laughs> and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm gonna, there'll be a rainbow or something up tomorrow. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you for that, Cody. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I do have a question, um, and uh, I'll, Kyle, do you have anything to add to that? Sorry, I, before, I wanted to. No, that's, sorry, that's yeah. totally fine. I think there's two things. I, I, language and safe zone training and visibility are huge, huge things. I think one thing that I've seen um, in running, especially the Pride page, is I get a lot of parents who reach out and say, you know, my kid's going to UND or my kid is moving to the city and I'm really nervous or scared or worried for them and I want to be able to connect them with somebody. Um, so I think having that connection is important, but also resources for parents, right? If you're living in rural North Dakota, you might not even know what it means. Like, how do I parent to an LGBT child? Um, I, and so I think, you know, we don't really have a great, um, there used to be Glisten um, in town, which is a, a parent um, group, and PFLAG, I think, was the other one, um, is, a, is a big parent group, and we don't have a very active community up here, at least in Grand Forks. So I think those are resources that would be important. And then I think I would be remiss if I didn't say one that's probably important for everybody, but especially for uh, LGBT folks is really mental health stuff. Um, I think that we absolutely, without a doubt, um, it's so important to have access to those mental health pieces when you don't feel like you have somebody you can talk to or trust. Like I've just have a number of um, good friends who needed that over the years and it's just a good thing anyway. So I think those two things are kind of in my head for um, ways, especially that the state can help to, you know, put some of those things together or just mm -hmm. make connections for folks. No, oh, that's a good point. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Okay, I do have a, another question from the audience. It says, in North Dakota, we are lacking basic protections for LGBTQ uh, people. In fact, and I didn't know this, um, you can still be evicted for being part of the LGBTQ community. I did not know that. So, has how has that affected you as you're renting and, and watching what's happened other than, I mean, feeling unwelcome, but how has that affected you? Have, have you had a, a manifestation of that in your own lives here in North Dakota? So that is maybe, a, do you think it's possible that that's just, a law that needs to be taken off the books and it's not enacted or, um, I mean, it sounds like, is it something you're afraid of when you rent someplace? Mm. So I, I, I can, uh, I can say that, um, you know, uh, Tim and I have been, uh, particularly lucky. We, we have not experienced this, uh, 
issue in North Dakota. Uh, however, I do know when, uh, when there were testimonials during the uh, Senate Bill 2303, uh, there were multiple individuals who, uh, who, discussed, um, who discussed being discriminated against uh, and evicted uh, based on uh, the discovery of their, uh, of their uh, sexual orientation. So, uh, like I said, while while we've been we've been pretty lucky um, to not experience that, it's definitely not something uh, that is unheard of in, in the state. It's definitely something that that occurs. Um, it often goes um, underreported because there are very few uh, recourses. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. The sort of good news is the Supreme Court decision uh, over the summer, of course, does have an impact on that here in North Dakota. Um, oh. And I think because of the way our laws are written, it might might also impact the housing piece. Um, it, the, the change was that the 1964 Civil Rights Act was ruled that it does protect sexual orientation, um, okay. gender identity. And so the way our laws in North Dakota are written, sexual orientation covers both gender identity. I'm not sure why the definition that does says that, but it does, which is useful in this case. So um, okay. I think that Department of Labor certainly is working through a lot of changes with that right now. Um, okay. But I think housing could also be impacted. So it's a positive thing. Okay. Yes, that's very positive. Uh, Cody, did you have some thoughts on that as well? Yeah, sorry, I was looking up um, another item as well. But um, and I think it's openly like just lesbian, gay, bisexual individuals. We don't um, get a lot of uh, pushback in this regard. Um, trans individuals absolutely do in the area. Um, uh, the North Dakota Fair Housing Center, um, they did a study on this um, last year, I think. Rebel Marie um, helped out with, with the study. Um, it, was, it ended up only being, I think, 30 or 40 individuals that they were able to send into apartment units to test um, landlords as to um, just bigoted notions in regards to showing apartments that were standard, substandard, etc. Mm -hmm. I know that they found that there at least a third of the individuals, trans individuals that were part of the test did get um, like discriminated in some fashion um, with that. I don't remember the specifics, but I so yeah, just that um, across the state, I know that trans people get discriminated against more than um, lesbian, gay, bisexual individuals in that regard. Could, do you, this is, might be a very difficult question, but why is that? Is it just because it's a, something that's newer in our consciousness or do you know why there's that? I would assume so. I would assume so, yeah. Uh maybe. Okay. Um because um I don't know, anybody else have a thought on that? Um that it just uh regular people being scared of what some what a person that they don't know. Visibility, yeah, that's fair, Kyle. Oh yeah. Um yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Um are there any other thoughts or questions right now for our audience and some of the people that are here um, that are not part of that LGBTQ um, plus community? I mean, did you guys know this? Or, you know, I, w I wonder like if it's a generational, like I'm 52 and, you know, is it like you were saying, like the youth are more open and uh, Clara, do you have your hand up or are you? Yeah, see what you're you're muted. Okay. I um I'm older than you. <laughs> <laughs> um part of part of me goes back to my days in college when I was in the theater department uh, as a theater major and it just wasn't odd because gay people tended to flock in those days um, to the arts, gay men especially. Um, 
gay women tended to go to sports. You know, we used to joke about, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so I've been around, you know, I've been involved with I should, the gay community, if you want to say that, for a long time. And I went to school in Dickinson, North Dakota. I grew up in Dickinson, North Dakota, went to college in Dickinson. So um, it's just not that big a deal to me. I've known it was there. I've known people who hid it a lot. Some, some are my age are still hiding it in southwestern North Dakota. Like living a double life sort of thing? Or? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, uh, it's funny that you just, this. I have a friend whose child grew up gay in southwestern North Dakota and of course went to the big city and she was quite concerned with that. And she had a right to be because he kind of went off the deep end. Oh, well, look, I'm in a community and he took advantage of, and others took advantage of him. Yeah. Um, he just was back visiting this week and he has a younger relative who's in high school growing up in a similar situation. And he took him, you know, to the, to, you know, under his wing this week, this last week to talk to him and explain, you know, have a heart to heart with him because the kid is going through so many things and had no one, still has no one in Southwestern North Dakota that he feels comfortable with talking. In a small town in Southwestern North Dakota, yeah. the bullying is extreme and oh, I, yeah. horrendous yeah. among yeah. peers and coming from adults. So yeah, I, you know, as, as I like to call myself an ally, and I've been for a long time, I have gay family members. Um, one of them is living with a transgender um, person. And, and you just, mental health issues is probably the biggest thing, you know, and, and, and it can't, I don't know if we need to address it specifically for having mental health um, facilitators and doctors and, and, and psychologists and um, be more educated in, in, in the gay experience, whether it's, it's, whether, um, it's uh, LGBTQ plus uh, um, whole issues or whether it's just, do they not know at all? <laughs> you know, do they, you know, do they go to the mental health facility? I know this for a fact that someone went to the mental health facility and they wanted in a uh, medical facility for help with mental illness and they wanted to convert them oh. to God and Jesus before they would really help them. And it just, you know, how do we change, how do we change that attitude in, in the whole state, but most particularly in the western part of the state where it is Very still lovely. horrible. Yeah, thank you for that, Clara. And uh, yeah, so I, uh, I do, I, I know we have Alex from Williston, western part of the state here. Alex, um, do you have any thoughts that you wanna share, not necessarily about this topic, but generally, um, talking about rural living and just being out in the west here? Well, I think, you know, a big thing to really mention is that if we can connect with other communities and like if we have an organization, um, I'm a part of Williston Rainbow Rendezvous. I started it five years ago. There was no other, no other organization in Williston or in the area really. And part of our focus is we also reach out to other communities because when we have different events like when we, we do a community meal, we try to do that every month. Obviously, right now we haven't really with COVID, but we do we do something every month to try to get everyone together. And we've um, we've incorporated. We now have a GSA in Williston. There's one in Watford. We've invited all of them. They usually come, and they're usually a very active part of our community too, like we're our organization. And there's people that come from Tioga and um, Ray Watford. Uh, Trenton, Sydney, Montana, even. Mm -hmm. um, we just, we, we try to focus on inviting people and allowing them to come to our events because we want to help like boost them up. And so I think if you do live in a small community, if you can reach out to the different com 
the different groups and organizations around you. Whether you live close to Williston, you can reach out to us. Whether Minot, you can reach out to Magic City Equality. And that way you can have a connection and usually they know a connection too. So I think that's, you know, that's very important to know, especially if you feel alone, because there's, there's a lot more people out there that want to connect with you. Right. Right. I mean, I think it's correct to say about 10% of any population, any human population mm -hmm. living in your community is part of your community. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, that's okay. Yeah. Um, Alex, I want to ask you a little bit more about your organization. Can you say the name again? Williston Rainbow Rendezvous. So how did you come to create that? I mean, were you were the, the, the founder? Yeah, so I, it kind of started where we just wanted to do something kind of like Pride. We wanted to test it out. And we farmed like we made a party out of it. And it was... I mean, people reacted to it. They loved it. We actually didn't have any backlash at the time. And so we, we were able to continue it. And from that, we, from, you know, a simple party, you know, we grew into an organization that's more for helping people. Now, now you know, we're very involved in other organizations too. I'm a board member for the NDHRC. I'm the summit coordinator for the statewide Indie LGBT summit. So, I mean. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's so important to just connect. And, you know, once we were able to connect with, you know, the smaller communities and bring them into, you know, we, we created a rendezvous basically. And yeah. that, that was our, that was our focus. And that's, I mean, we've definitely done it and we want to yeah. keep building that and building the communities and helping. Yeah. Gosh, that's so important. I mean, I just, thanks for explaining that. Um, and I think James, could you tell us a, a little bit more about Magic City Equality? Did you start that or what, what, what was that path? Similar path or? Uh, I did not start it, but I have been a part of it for the past few years. Uh, when it, originally when it was Pride Minot and that started uh, 20, in 2013. 2013. Yes. Uh, and it became Magic City Equality uh, officially last year. Uh, and we also, uh, this past, actually this past, this year, we've, we've become a, a 501c3 and nonprofit for the state of North Dakota. Uh, and originally, uh, Pride and Monat was created to kind of serve as um, the committee for Pride each year. Um, and last year, uh, the board, the last functioning board for Pride and Monat, which is actually still the board now for Magic City Quality, decided to take that in a different direction and to uh, not only put on uh, the Pride Festival, um, which actually is going to be happening um, in a few weeks here. Mm -hmm. We moved it because of COVID. Um, we've also um, put together programs uh, such as like the youth program that I had mentioned earlier, um, as well as kind of a similar program for uh, for people who are transgender, uh, non-binary, or gender non-conforming. Uh, those kind of stopped for a while because of COVID, because you can really have meetings. Yeah. Um, so we've done that, and we're, we're also working on some other programs that hopefully, um, you know, with COVID will kind of, you know, say goodbye, and we can kind of get back to some level of normal normality. So we can be able to do those things. Um, yeah. But also throughout the year, <laughs> excuse me, we've um, helped uh, other organizations like also what I mentioned earlier. Uh, in Belcourt last week, we helped with the Turtle Mountain Two Spirit Society, um, yeah. helping to raise awareness um, and put on an equality march up there. Um, you know, we've helped different organizations uh, we've done events throughout the year to kind of bring awareness to different uh, aspects of LGBTQ, two-spirit plus culture and history. Mm -hmm. And basically kind of helping to, um, I think it was Cody that had mentioned earlier um, about parents, or no, it was uh, Kyle actually, um, about parents, you know, contacting him 
you know, okay. about you know, people or their students moving to their area. And sometimes, you know, we'll get parents reaching out to us, you know, saying, you know, you know, my child is in the process of transitioning and, you know, we need, or they haven't yet, but they want to, and where can they go to, you know, get that health, um, you know, to get that type of health care, you know, for transitioning. So we kind of guide them in that general direction as well. And, you know, pretty much serve as a way, uh, a resource for parents or, you know, for members of the community or their parents or their kids or yeah. Yeah. allies or, you know, whoever needs the help or assistance. Okay. So that's, that's kind of what we do. That's good. And I'm really glad that we're doing this Facebook Live and this will be, rec you know, this is recorded and, you know, um, hopefully there's, there's a lot of ears that are listening that are just having all those same questions. And I think it's probably pretty inspirational for them to see, you know, they're doing okay and, and uh, you, you do have a strong community. It's developing anyway, and we're becoming more aware. We do have a question from Facebook. Um, what are the biggest priorities of the LGBTQ community when it comes to policies? So, I mean, it sounds like we have a lot of work to do, uh, but what would be kind of um, your priorities that I can help you with in the next four years as your governor? <laughs> Is Tyler still on? He's our policy guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm still on. Uh, one thing would be, um, as I mentioned earlier in my, my opening remarks, uh, ensuring that uh, we have services to, uh, to address uh, the needs of our LGBTQ homeless youth. Okay. Uh, as, as I had mentioned, um, uh, those individuals are upwards of 120 percent more likely to experience homelessness in their lives um, than than the general population um, the general youth population so uh, that's that's one facet um, having having programs uh, it, it could lead to um, uh, a council on uh, homelessness uh, as a broad stroke but then interdepartmentally be a, uh, have guidelines and, and programs put in place for LGBTQ uh, plus youth. Um, crisis centers. Crisis centers uh, is another big yeah. thing. I believe yep. educational centers for for families. I, I know that was mentioned earlier. That would be that would be great. That would be perfect. Uh, and, and then just um, protections, uh, not just with, um, with, with housing discrimination, but uh, discrimination in the workplace and uh, particularly uh, refusal of service. I know that the Supreme Court did, uh, did make that decision um, that, that was um, very monumental, um, but there will always be people who try to subvert that. And there is always the possibility that a state or local government will not uh, will simply not enforce um, enforce that decision. So um, the the battle goes on. The battle goes on. Oh yeah. And you always have to keep after you even get it. You still have to keep defending it. <laughs> so it doesn't stop with just one law being made because it'll always be challenged. Oh. Um, Cody, do you have uh, something to say about that particular? question about uh, uh, the priorities, the biggest priorities of the LGBTQ uh, community when it comes to policies. That's a question from Facebook. Policies themselves. I think it's interesting because like, again, we've been fighting for like almost 10 years for just basic anti-discrimination legislation to be put in place. And so at this point, it's like, that's <laughs> that's it feels like the biggest push but like then when i actually like talk to clients and other community members it also comes down to the fact that like when somebody's discriminated against 
even if it's illegal, like it takes a lot to despite that as well. And to, like Kyle had said yes. earlier on another topic, it's about visibility and somebody has to know that it's illegal for them to be discriminated against and then them get the resources to fight that. And I don't know how to change that part. Um, but it, and uh, Western North Dakota is a very desolate area as, as we've all noticed um, in those terms as well. And so it's like, yes, anti-discrimination legislation is kind of the the result that I want, um, but it's also how do we make young people aware that them being hurt mm -hmm. is not okay and how they um, like defend themselves maybe, or like how, like, I don't know. That's what I got. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. I'm sorry, did somebody have something to say there? Well, I was just going to say that's that's perfect. It kind of, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of the 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 parable of um you know we can pull someone out of the water but we don't know exactly we haven't quite figured out yet how to keep them from falling in the water in the first place and we certainly haven't figured out how to keep them from falling back into uh the water those are those are the gaps we've been fighting so hard for for just the the basics uh and get challenged left and right um, both in courts and um, as a consequence of elections um, that you know there's still so much uh, that, that's that's left to be that's left to be addressed yeah and, and I, there's a question from Claire talking about what Tyler and Cody are just saying does ACLU enter in for resources or help for lawsuits if necessary is that very active here in North Dakota for this or not uh, do you know there, there are certain there are certain instances where the ACLU will step in um, one instance was um, in opposition to a anti-discrimination bill in, in the house last year that did not include uh, gender protections um, protection regarding gender identity um, I'm not aware of any any court cases offhand. Certainly not since since I've been here. But um, but usually usually when the ACLU jumps into something, it's it's for a, a broader national scope. So what has an implication for one state uh, typically has implications for a lot of others, whether it comes from um, that state or not. Okay. Um, it looks like Clara has her hand raised, either a question or something to say. Yeah, just a perhaps uninformed comment, please tell me if this is the wrong way to look at it. Um, but I guess an argument that I would have in support of passing, whether that be like hate crime legislation or anti-discrimination legislation is also sending a message to those folks who would consider for doing those things is that there's an understanding that the state will not tolerate that um, and start kind of going back to what I said earlier about setting the public standard of how we treat people. And so if we can change that culturally and then have that reinforced by the state, I can, I would hope that would deter some people from pushing folks into the river. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. Shelly, I think of a couple of things administratively, even that we can do to, to get at that, right? It's that feeling of welcome. And, you know, some of it is as simple as a rainbow sticker on your door, but I don't know if all the forms have been updated. Um, I remember this has been a few years back, so maybe it's fixed and I, you know, I'll reserve judgment for when I know for sure, but a uh, hunting license, you know, if you're applying for those sorts of things, having the right language for your spouse or having kind of all of that stuff updated versus wife, husband. Um, okay. There's a lot yeah. of paperwork with a lot of things like that. Oh, that's, um, government does have a lot of paperwork. It does. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think from a, from a legislative policy perspective, what I think about is, I mean, it's really kitchen table issues for LGBT folks as well, right? I mean, non-discrimination stuff is important, but we, 
all care about the same issues that normal people care about as well. And I'm sure you've seen that meme of, you know, buy bread, buy milk, take over the world, like that sort of thing, <laughs> which is a little tongue in cheek, but um, somewhat true. <laughs> so I think I just, you know, policies that help make North Dakota feel like a more welcoming place mm -hmm. are important. Most of my friends who move away, move away because they don't feel like there's the culture here that's an engaging place to be. They don't, they can't easily find friends. It just, it's that sort of resounding thing. So I think fixing language, helping visibility, implementing, um, even even caring about arts and entertainment, right? Like right. supporting the arts is something that LGBT people care about. And that's uh, some place that we feel welcome. And, um, you know, the more arts are, I think that also sends a different sign. So I just, yeah. some of them aren't really LGBT specific. They really help everybody, but can make a big impact for, yeah. for so. Yeah. And those, th those are avenues of expression. And then through those right. avenues of expression, and express and, yeah. and we'll know more you know at, you know and so um so i would like to we're I'm gonna be uh, unless there's any other questions right now and you can please send some to us but i do want to say that i've learned stuff today and uh you will see a rainbow uh, at my place and I encourage all business owners and, and places where you work, uh, ask, if, ask your boss if you can hang a rainbow just to see, um, you know, if it's okay. And, and then other people can come up. But just, I love those ideas. Um, and I, if elected, I will work to uh, have that visibility represented in the administration and open and for all human um, equality. And uh, so with that, if there are no more questions, I have just a few closing remarks. Um, so like I said, this is part of our listening session. Um, there's so many groups out there that need to be heard and we need to hear you. And uh, this is our larger effort to ensure that our government works for all of us and that our leaders are in touch with their neighbors. Uh, to do that, we do need decisive leadership that will uni unite all North Dakotans, West or East, LGBTQ or not, uh, people of color, people that are forgotten, but listen to the needs of all those communities. As governor, I will be decisive, collaborative, and transparent. Last night, driving home in the storm, I saw a big rainbow. We have big rainbows here in North Dakota. So let's make sure the rainbow encircles all of North Dakota. Together, that I believe that we can get through these challenging times to help our communities thrive. I hope I can count on your support to help bring a practical and responsive voice to the governor's office. Please visit lens-vig4nd.com to make a contribution, learn more about me and my Lieutenant Governor Ben Vig, or to get to get involved to have listening sessions like this of a, an, a, a subject that you'd like to do, or to add comments if you're a little shy tonight speaking out and you need to, would like to get in contact with some of our speakers tonight, please, please, please use us as a very um, quiet and open uh, avenue for you to, to reach each other. So uh, if you would like to host a listening session in your own community or virtually, I would love to continue this discussion. So please contact info at lens ndcom to make those arrangements. Once again, thank you for attending, for speaking, for listening, for sharing my pride and your pride in our great state. So let's keep the conversation going and let's be visible. And, um, you know, we are all a community. So thank you, everybody. Mm.